chapter nine is about supply uncertainty. This is, of course, an enormous topic right now. And so I decided to add to the material in the book some stuff that's a little bit more like philosophical about supply disruptions. I've been doing research on supply disruptions since my dissertation almost 20 years ago. And um, so this is something I have talked about a lot. And I took bits and pieces of a bunch of different presentations that I've given in the past and put them into these slides. Some of this I also added to the book chapter itself, and some of it I did not. So in the chapter, there's lots of mathematical models, and we will talk about those, don't you worry. But the goal for the rest of today is really just to talk about some of the more like, you know, philosophical and um, real world kind of aspects of supply chain, supply uncertainty. Okay. All right. So first of all, you should know that there are different kinds of supply uncertainty. I mean, in, in the, whole, the whole semester so far, we have basically only talked about demand uncertainty, right? News vendor model, risk pooling, um, the stuff on uncertain, on, on stochastic facility location that we skipped. You know, whenever we've talked about uncertainty, it's basically been demand uncertainty. But there is also supply uncertainty. And supply uncertainty kind of comes in a few different forms. One is disruptions. So in a supply disruption, the supply of goods is completely interrupted. It's a binary thing. Either there is a disruption or there's not. And these can be due to things like bad weather or natural disasters or labor strikes and things like that. The supply of a given product or the supply, you know, the, the ability of your own facility to function is just completely interrupted. A second kind of supply uncertainty is yield uncertainty. In yield uncertainty, if you place an order to your supplier and your supplier has yield uncertainty, then you'll still get product. It's just that it will be not the same amount that you ordered. And this can happen for a couple of reasons. It could be that some of the products that they ship to you are defective, right? So you have you order 100 units and randomly some of them are defective and you have to return them or throw them out. It could be just because the supplier runs out of inventory or capacity. So you ordered 100, but they sent you 90 because they didn't have enough. Or it could be due to some kind of batch process that has natural yield uncertainty inherent in it. Like when you produce chemicals, you put in your raw materials and you, you know, set the temperatures and pressures and, and everything the way you need to. And in the end, you get the chemical that you're trying to produce, but you don't always get a deterministic amount of it. There might be some randomness just due to random fluctuations in the physics and chemistry of the process that's producing the chemicals. Okay, so that's another example of yield uncertainty. Another example is agriculture. I mean, you plant a bunch of seeds, you're hoping to harvest a thousand pounds of potatoes, but you might harvest 900 pounds and you might harvest 1,200 pounds. Next type of supply uncertainty is capacity uncertainty. You have uncertainty in the quantity that the supplier can produce. So you place an order and it turns out the supplier can only supply a certain amount of that order. The, that sounds a lot like yield uncertainty. The difference is that it tends to be independent of the order quantity. In yield uncertainty, it's usually, at least the way we usually model it is, I order Q units and I get Q plus or minus something. In capacity uncertainty, the supplier's capacity is fixed. It's, it's, it's random, but it's fixed to some number that's independent of how much we choose to order. So if I order 100, I might get 90. And if I order 700, I might get 90, right? It's just because of some limitation in the supplier's capacity. And finally, there's lead time uncertainty. You place an order and the lead time is stochastic. And that can happen because of delays at the port or delays in shipping or some kind of stockouts or whatever. Now, obviously, there's no clear line between these types of supply uncertainty. I mean, if you're operating a supply chain and you place an order for 100 units that's supposed to arrive in one week, and instead you get 80 units in one week and the extra 20 units a week later, is that because of a disruption? Is it because of yield uncertainty, capacity uncertainty, lead time uncertainty? You might not know, and you might, and there might not even be an answer whether you know it or not. Whether you know it, it, 
there might not even be an answer, regardless of your ability to know the answer. It might not be just due to one of those things. So, um, but when we, when we model these things, we tend to model them differently for the different types. And so as a, you know, modeling exercise or, you know, a way of building mathematical models that we can optimize, we kind of have to pick one form of supply uncertainty. But in practice, they're kind of mixed together in certain ways. And practitioners don't tend to discuss them in these categories. Practitioners, people who are really managing supply chains, tend to talk about them all as disruptions. I thought I was going to get a certain amount of product at a certain time. It didn't happen. The supply was disrupted. And that's a perfectly reasonable way to talk about it. Um, so again, in practice, when you hear people talk about disruptions, they really could mean any of these kinds of things. Whereas in, you know, OR classes, we're going to tend to talk about disruptions as a particular thing that we can model and yield uncertainty as a slightly different thing and so on. All right. Any questions about any of that? What's like an example of capacity uncertainty? Well, capacity uncertainty can happen because of a disruption, for example. Like we, there was a, a machine breakdown at my supplier. And so the supplier can actually produce and still send me stuff. It's not a complete disruption, but their capacity is reduced. And so it used to be that they were able to meet all of the demand from me and all of my competitors but now they don't have enough demand and they don't have enough capacity. And so all of us are gonna to have to be shorted a bit. And the amount that we're gonna be able to get is independent of how much we order. It's just gonna be dependent on how much the capacity is. Okay, other questions? Just to add to that, um, I faced some problems with capacity uncertainty because I was at an internship with a vaccine company and they were planning on building a new facility, um, you know, specifically for that reason of increasing their capacity and there was a delay with the construction of that facility so they wound up not having enough room so that is that also capacity uncertainty yeah i mean that's capacity uncertainty at a more strategic level like can i build this new factory or not the capacity uncertainty i'm talking about here is a little bit more like the tactical level i'm placing orders to replenish my inventory and it's unclear how much capacity my supplier will have to replenish, to, to, to fulfill those orders, but it's, it's a similar idea. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So here's a roadmap of where, what we're gonna cover in this chapter. The first section is some examples of disruptions from the past, as well as a little detour that I call the four myths of supply chain disruptions. Section 9.3 talks about inventory models with disruptions, specifically disruptions the way I'm talking about them here. 9.4 is about inventory models with yield uncertainty. And in both of those two sections, 9.3 and 9.4 will cover models that are similar to EOQ and models that are similar to the infinite horizon news vendor, the like base stock type problem. The idea is just like, you know, imagine in the EOQ, you're, play, you're doing your sawtooth thing and suddenly it's, your inventory is zero and it's time to place an order and the supplier says, oh, sorry, I'm closed, right? That's a disruption. Or you go to place your order of size Q and what you actually get is 90% of Q, that's yield uncertainty or you know, similarly in the news vendor type problem. So we'll look at a couple different cases, disruptions, yield uncertainty, and EOQ, infinite horizon news vendor. Then in section 9.5, we'll briefly discuss something called the risk diversification effect, which is the supply uncertainty version of the risk pooling effect. Okay, so when you have demand uncertainty, risk pooling effect tells you something. When you have supply uncertainty, this risk diversification effect tells you something different. And then finally, section 9.6 is on facility location with disruptions. Okay, so most of the chapter is about inventory stuff. The last section is about facility location. Now, in most of these models, we'll assume that the demand is deterministic. So we've been looking at inventory models, for example, where the demand is random, but the supply is, is deterministic. Now we're gonna swap it and assume the demand is deterministic and the supply is random. And some of that is for tractability. The models are just harder if you wanna have random demand and random supply. But also 
you know, part of the goal here is to highlight the effect of supply uncertainty, to, to, to look at qualitatively, what does it change in the supply chain when we have supply uncertainty? And so we strip out the demand uncertainty just so we can zero in on the supply uncertainty, okay? In some ways, supply uncertainty and demand uncertainty are very similar to each other. I mean, again, if you go to the store right now and you try to buy toilet paper is th and there's none there, is that because there's too little supply or is that because there's too much demand? I mean, again, we don't know and there's no, there's no answer to that. It's both, right? Um, and so in some sense, it's not really clear that it's even useful to differentiate between supply uncertainty and demand uncertainty because both of them just mean like I have a mismatch between the supply and the demand. Did that mismatch happen because the supply was too low? Did that mismatch happen because the demand was too high? I mean we don't know, maybe we don't care, and maybe it's just all the same and I don't need this chapter at all. And moreover, um, in many cases the strategies you use to mitigate demand uncertainty are similar to those that you use to mitigate supply uncertainty. You can have safety stock, you can have multiple suppliers, you can have extra capacity, um, you can use transshipments, right? So, you know, so on the one hand you might think like we already know how to deal with supply, with supply uncertainty because we know how to deal with demand uncertainty but it turns out that the models are different and the interpretations are different. And so it is worth looking at supply uncertainty by itself and not being tempted to treat it as like a special case of demand uncertainty, okay? And we'll come back to this point later. You'll, you'll get a clearer sense of what I mean. Okay, so let me give you some examples of supply chain disruptions that have happened. I mean, I bet you can think of some all on your own, but I'll give you some examples anyway. So first of all, I like to make the point that supply chain disruptions are as old as supply chains are. This is a painting of the wreck of the Admiral Gardner, which was a ship owned by the East India Company. And the Admiral Gardner was shipping a bunch of stuff, primarily copper coins from England to Madras, India in 1805, or sorry, 1809, and it sank. There was bad weather shortly after it left its port in England and it sank. And those copper coins had been specially minted for a particular region in India. Um, those all were lost, of course, as well as the other cargo that was on the ship, which was a bunch of military equipment like cannonballs and, and, and other sorts of um, weaponry and ammunition. So this ship sank in you know, 1809 and um, this, the East India Company was one of the world's largest supply chains for a long time. And, um, you know, this is an example of the fact that supply chain disruptions have been around as long as supply chains have. By the way, as a postscript to this little story, the shipwreck was recovered in like the 1980s. And actually, if you go on eBay now and try to buy Admiral Gardner coins, you can buy them. So. Um, you know, all, all, all disruptions end eventually, I guess, and wind up on eBay, but anyway, okay, so um, you get the point. Here's an example, here's a picture of a stagecoach robbery. You know that Wells Fargo, before it was a bank, was a company that delivered people and goods across the country, and um, often using stagecoaches, and those stagecoaches were sometimes robbed by bandits, and so here's a photograph of some um, unfortunate people being robbed by bandits. I'm a little skeptical that this is a real photograph because, I mean, back in the day, it would take like 45 minutes just to set up the camera and it's a little bit hard to imagine the robbery pausing while they did that. I have a feeling this might be staged, but anyway, it's a good visual anyway. Okay, so uh, let's get to some more modern and some more real disruptions. In the, in the supply chain disruption literature, the example I'm about to tell you is everywhere. Everyone loves this example, so you may have heard it before, you may hear it again. Here's the idea. In 2001, there was a semiconductor plant in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the United States, that sold semiconductors to Nokia and Ericsson, which well, I'm sure you know Nokia, you may or may not know Ericsson, those are both cell phone manufacturers, and this was 2001 when the mobile phone industry was really just starting to boom. 
So Nokia and Ericsson both bought their semiconductors for certain models of phones from this plant in Albuquerque. Now in 2001, there was a fire at this factory. It was set off by a lightning strike. The fire lasted 10 minutes, then they put it out, but the damage that it did was significant and the, the factory was shut down or partly disabled for many weeks after that. So Ericsson was hurt very badly by this. This was the only supplier that they had for this particular type of microchip. They had to shut down their production. Ericsson is based in Sweden, by the way. Um, they had to shut down their production. They lost $400 million of revenue and 50% of their share price. Nokia, on the other hand, did a kind of amazing job of noticing that something had gone wrong even before Philips told them that there was a problem at this plant. They noticed that the supply was starting to be, um, you know, not as stable as it should have been. And they very quickly went into high gear to redesign chips so that they could be manufactured at other locations. They traveled around the world to meet with their suppliers and get suppliers that to be able to like, you know, they basically pressured their suppliers to produce stuff for them because they were a big customer of those suppliers. And they were extremely proactive about managing this disruption. And as a result, they didn't have much of a dip in their own sales. And in fact, they managed to steal something like 25% of Ericsson's market share. I have to admit, I'm not even sure if Ericsson exists anymore. Does anyone know? Does anyone have an Ericsson phone? I, I, I don't think so, but I'm sure many of you have Nokia phones. Um, so this was like a big kind of wake up call to, to supply chain people about both how big an impact disruptions can have, but also about how the extent to which they can be mitigated with like careful planning and good like reactions to the disruptions. Okay. All right. Another example was a year later in 2002, there was a big, it's called a lockout, but it's sort of a technical distinction. You can think of it basically as a strike. The longshoremen who worked at the ports on the west coast of the United States, like the port of Los Angeles and ports further up the, the west coast, went on strike. Um, they, those ports are major sources of imports for the United States, something like 50% or more of the containerized imports. That means imports that come into the country in big shipping containers, um, as opposed to like, you know, air freight individual packages. Um, more than 50% of the U.S. containerized imports pass through those ports. And so the workers shut down those ports for 10 days. And they did it right in September and October, like right in the ramp up to the holiday season when all of the retailers were bulking up their supply chains to have inventory of toys and electronics and all the things that people were going to be buying in December. Of course, the workers chose that, that time period on purpose to cause like the maximum pain. And this was a really expensive um, you know, disruption that cost the U.S. economy. It's a little hard to estimate, but estimates range from something like half a billion to $2 billion per day of this 10-day shutdown. Um, oops. Another big disruption was caused by the earthquake in Japan in 2011. You've heard of this earthquake for sure. It um, caused a giant tsunami. Fif more than 15,000 people died. The Fukushima nuclear power plant was disabled in the, in the tsunami. And um, there were many other sort of humanitarian and environmental disasters as a result of this earthquake, but we'll focus on the supply chain disruption. And in particular, we'll focus on Toyota. So Toyota was located, you know, did most of their manufacturing in Japan, not that close to the epicenter of the earthquake, but that didn't matter. The whole, the whole country was disrupted by the earthquake and the tsunami. And Toyota was famous for a manufacturing strategy called just-in-time manufacturing, where they would hold very, very little inventory of raw materials. They would, they would talk about having only hours of raw material supply available, meaning just as the raw material inventory was getting down to zero because you know, the manufacturing process was using up this raw material, just as the inventory level was going down to zero, a new shipment would arrive from the suppliers. It was just in time. And this was a, a strategy that um, Toyota pioneered and became very famous for. 
And it's a super efficient strategy. The problem is, if you have a disruption, it affects the, the supply chain almost immediately because you have no slack, no buffer, no extra inventory to protect you against disruptions in the supply. And in addition to that being a core part of Toyota's manufacturing strategy, another core part was to centralize all of their manufacturing in Japan and centralize all of their suppliers in Japan which again is very cost effective as long as everything's going well. But when this earthquake hit, it essentially shut down Toyota's entire production system and its entire supply base. And Toyota took a huge hit. They lost something like 75% in quarterly profit. And for the first time in a decade or more, Toyota was no longer the number one vehicle manufacturer in the world. It lost that ranking to General Motors who incidentally has a much broader, ge geographically broader manufacturing and supply base. Um, but also, you know, they weren't, GM was barely affected by the earthquake because of, um, because of the earthquake was in Japan and only a small portion of GM's manufacturing is in Japan. Um, after this earthquake, Toyota sort of learned its lesson and put in a lot of plans to diversify their supply base to make sure that they have multiple suppliers for each of the critical parts that they use to keep very careful track. They built this new database of all their suppliers and, and the status of all those suppliers so that they could be much more nimble if there was a disruption. Um, although in 2016, there was another earthquake and the evidence that I've seen is that Toyota was again hit pretty hard by that, even though they had put these, these plans in place in the intervening five years. Any questions about any of those examples so far? Okay. And of course, the one that's on our mind now is the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. So we've seen massive shortages of toilet paper, of N95 masks, of personal protective equipment, of hand sanitizer. Um, my guess, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to guess that this will be the largest supply chain disruption in history when all is said and done. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Institute for Supply Management did a survey and found that at least 75% of companies have reported some sort of supply chain disruption. That was a couple weeks old. I'm sure it's higher by now. And I think two things that are making this situation even worse than other supply disruptions are, first of all, the sort of base or epicenter of the supply chain disruption is everywhere, right? It's not due to one earthquake in one part of the world or one strike at, in one coast of the US. This is due to something that's happening literally everywhere. Everywhere around the world, workers are unable to go to work to manufacture stuff or to put things on the shelves. And that's that means that this disruption, instead of having the usual kind of ripple effect where you have a disruption in one place and then it ripples to everywhere else, we have a disruption that's kind of starting everywhere. And then the other thing is that at the same time as we have supply uncertainty, a supply disruption, we also have demand spikes. So, you know, we had stable supply and demand for, for toilet paper and then the demand went way up and the supply went down. And both of those things happening at once is a particular problem. I mean, um, for N95 masks, for example, the demand went up and a lot of the supply for the raw materials for N95 masks happens to come from China. And China was hit very hard by the pandemic as well. And so they weren't able to manufacture the raw materials for masks. And when they were, they were often keeping them in their own country instead of, instead of exporting them. And so we had a supply disruption of the raw materials for the masks. And similar things have happened with toilet paper. For example, it turns out that Italy is a major um, hub for manufacturing paper of all kinds. And so Italy has been hit super hard by the pandemic. And they're part of the shortages of toilet paper, at least in Europe, are stemming from the fact that the supply is disrupted. So when the supply and the demand are both going a bit haywire, it can be, it can be really hard. And I think that's, we're seeing both of those things happen in, in the disruption today, okay? Now, disruptions are old, but it's really only in the last, well, I mean, by now it's been a while. It's been maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years that people have been starting to look at supply disruptions, both in um, 
you know, both in um, academia and in practice, you know, it's been maybe 10 or 20 years that people have started to pay attention. But supply chains themselves have been studied for several decades beyond that. And of course, supply chains have existed for centuries before that. So, um, you know, one question is why, why do people care now? Why is there a recent interest in supply chain disruptions? And I have three, um, I have three answers to that question. The first reason is that there just have been a bunch of high profile disruptions. There's all the ones we've talked about in previous slides. And there's 9-11, Hurricane Katrina and Rita in 2005. I don't know if you remember in 2010, there was this volcano in Iceland that erupted and it sent these huge ash clouds into the sky. And it meant that airplanes couldn't travel basically in Europe for several days. And that was a big supply disruption. 2012, Superstorm Sandy in the Northeastern coast of the United States. 2015, big flooding in Chennai, India all of these big high, pro high profile things and um, people have taken notice. I mean, this every time one of these things happens, everybody says, oh my gosh, we have to make our supply chains more resilient. Little, little bits of things tend to happen, but um, then another disruption comes along and we realize we didn't really do a, good, a particularly good job at protecting our supply chains. The second reason why there's been a lot of interest lately is that there's also been a real push, a real interest in lean supply chain management. Lean is another buzzword that I'm sure you've heard. It's very closely related to just in time that we talked about with Toyota. The idea is squeeze all the slack out of the system. No extra inventory, no extra capacity, no extra workforce. Just run everything super lean. And that's great, they're very efficient, as long as there's very little supply uncertainty or any kind of uncertainty. But as soon as there's any kind of uncertainty, the system is very easily disrupted. Lean supply chains tend to be very, very fragile. But they're really popular. I mean, this is just a sampling of the books I found when I Googled, you know, lean supply chain management books. There are lots of them and, and a lot of businesses you know, adhere to lean as a core strategy in their, in their operations. Um, but there's recognition now that lean is not, lean, lean leaves you very vulnerable to disruptions and other sorts of uncertainty. A third reason, oh yes, and so my, my big thing is there's value to having slack in the system. Lean tries to squeeze all the slack out. But that slack, whether it's inventory or capacity or whatever, can play a really important role when there's a disruption. So it's important to have some of it there. Now, there's still a question of how much slack you need and what form it should take. Should it be inventory or capacity or flexibility? Or um, where in the supply chain should it be? Should it be near the customer end? Should it be near the supplier end? Um, all of those are still important questions, and that's part of the point of the mathematical models that we'll look at later in the chapter. But as a philosophy, I think it's worth keeping in mind that there is value to having slack. That doesn't mean we always need tons of slack, but it, all, it does mean we shouldn't just blindly try to squeeze all the slack out, okay? And then the third reason for the increase in interest in supply chain disruptions is that our supply chains are totally global now. I mean, um, 20, 30 years ago, supply chains were much more consolidated geographically, but now most major supply chains span the entire globe. There is less vertical integration, like it used to be um, that an, you know, a computer factory, let's say, would take in raw materials like glass and plastic and um, you know, silicon and spit out computers. Now a computer factory takes in much more already assembled parts, components like hard drives and monitors and trackpads and all of those components and then they just assemble it. So firms that used to be true manufacturing firms like IBM and General Motors really actually manufacture relatively little these days they just assemble components that they buy from third parties. And this is a point that Thomas Friedman makes in his book, The World is Flat, which is a pretty old book by now, but you may have heard of it. Moreover, those, and, and the reason that leads to supply chain disruptions is just that if, if 
if you don't have the ability to do your own manufacturing and instead you're relying on tens or hundreds or thousands of suppliers, then any disruption in that supply base can really cost you. Um, and moreover, those firms that, that manufacturing firms depend on, the supplier firms, are all over the world and many of them are in regions that are unstable. They could be unstable because of politics or economics or, you know, un, or military actions or climate or earthquakes or whatever. But, you know, all over the world, there are various forms of un, 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 instability. And if suppliers are located in those regions, that leads to the potential for disruptions. And there's a book about this topic called At The End of the Line by Barry Lynn that you can check out if you want to read more about that. Okay, any questions so far? Or comments or thoughts or anything you want to discuss? I guess my question is why haven't we learned? Why haven't we turned around and actually done something yeah. uh, to improve? That's to a great on? question. The next section is going to try to answer that question a little bit. Um, I think the, sh the short answer is because it's expensive or because people think it's expensive. I, I'm about to, uh, to tell you four things that I think companies think of when we say, look, you have to build a supply chain that's resilient to disruptions. And then I want to explain why I don't think those are good enough reasons to, 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 to do nothing. Um, but I'll tell you the things that I think companies are thinking that makes them decide to do little or nothing. So before we get there, any other questions? Okay, so these are what I call the four myths about supply chain disruptions. The first myth, I mean, these are things that I've heard either companies that I've worked with or talked to or things that you read in the, in the news, right? Think, things that I think companies are thinking when they get the message that they should be preparing for disruptions, but they don't want to do it. And I think the four reasons that they don't want to do it are one, they say, well, supply chain disruptions are rare, right? These are rare events. I mean, yes, there was a massive earthquake in Japan, but that doesn't happen that often. Or yes, there was flooding in New Orleans, but that doesn't happen that often. Or yes, there's this pandemic, but that doesn't happen that often, right? So disruptions are infrequent. Two, they only affect a small part of the supply chain, like a fire in one factory, no big deal, right? My supply chain is massive. If there's one little part of it that's disrupted, it's not a big deal. Three is, and I think this is probably the big one, it feels really expensive to protect against disruptions. The whole supply chain world for decades has been saying lean, 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 just in time, just in time, just in time. Get rid of all the slack. Don't invest in, you know, in redundancy. Um, and it's hard to go against that message when that's the message you've been getting from the CEO and from the business gurus for a long time. It feels like it would be really expensive to protect against disruptions. Plus, you don't know where they're going to come from, right? Is the next disruption going to be a flood or a lightning strike or a pandemic or an earthquake? We don't know. Um, and so how do you protect against that? And fourth, as we talked about earlier today, we're already protecting against disruption risk because we're protecting against demand risk, right? Remember we said having inventory, having backup suppliers, having flexibility are all things that we do to protect against demand uncertainty, but they also play a role in protecting against supply uncertainty. So eh, why bother? So I imagine these companies sort of going through these four, four reasons and saying, therefore, I'm not going to invest money to protect against supply disruptions. Okay, so let's talk about why these are only myths, why I think all of these are false. Myth number one, disruptions occur infrequently. Well, first of all, disruptions can be large or small. And although it may be true that disruptions of the magnitude of Hurricane Katrina or the earthquake in Fukushima or COVID, although disruptions of that scale might be rare, although actually, I mean, I'm not... I'm not even sure we could say that they're rare. Yes, pandemics are rare and hurricanes are rare and lightning strikes are rare and earthquakes are rare and, what, and floods are rare. But all of those things together, I mean, practically, you know, every year there are multiple newsworthy disruptions, right? So taken as a whole, it is not true that disruptions occur infrequently. But even if, you, even if they do, even if I stipulate that that disruptions of the magnitude of Katrina or COVID-19 are rare, 
smaller disruptions are still very common, like machine breakdowns and suppliers being out of stock and things like that. Those disruptions happen much more frequently. And those disruptions too can have a big effect and can be protected against. And actually full disclosure, I mean, the models that we'll talk about in this chapter in many ways are really meant for those smaller scale disruptions. I, I can't pretend to be able to be about to present models to you that would have saved today's supply chains from toilet paper stockouts. I mean, that one's probably too big for any realistic model to have captured, but smaller scale disruptions do happen often and um, those models can help in that case. Um, continuing on with this first myth about disruptions occurring infrequently, Walmart has, this number is old, so it's probably different by now, but let's say 166 distribution centers in the United States. I'll grant that the probability of a disruption at any one of them is rare, is small. Let's say the, the disruption risk is like 0.1% per year that a given distribution center has a disruption. But taken over those 166 distribution centers, the probability that at least one of them is disrupted in a given year is high. It's like 15%. And if you account for Walmart's, you know, 11,000 plus stores around the world, then the probability is virtually 100% that, some, that one of those or more than one of those locations is going to be disrupted. And in fact, Walmart faces disruptions of one kind and another just about every day. And they have a dedicated emergency operations center that's in the picture below that's there just to deal with stuff that goes wrong. And it doesn't have to be a supply disruption. It could be, you know, it could be other things. Um, but there's enough of that kind of stuff happening in the supply chain that they have a dedicated center just for dealing with it. Continuing with the theme about whether or not disruptions are really infrequent, I mean, before Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the Army Corps of Engineers had done a study that said, what is the risk of a hurricane that floods New Orleans? And they found that that risk was something like 250 to one per year, right? So the odds of a hurricane that would flood New Orleans are something like 250 to one per year. But during the average person's 77 year lifespan, that means a 27% chance of seeing New Orleans flooded. So these small, you know, probabilities of disruption really compound when you're looking at a long time horizon or multiple locations. And, and so it really is not true that disruptions only occur infrequently. Second myth, that disruptions are localized. They only affect a small part of the supply chain. Just to give an example of why that reasoning is false, in 1998, there were strikes at two General Motors parts plants, so factories that make parts that go into General Motors cars. Okay, so there's our two, our two parts plants that get disrupted. And because those parts plants were disrupted, there was no point in making parts at a bunch of other parts plants. Like if you can't get this one critical part, then there's no reason to continue making the other parts that are gonna go into the same car. You're gonna have to shut down production of the car. So you're also gonna shut down production of the other parts, which means that more than a hundred other parts plants were shut down. And then of course you had to close the assembly plants because you didn't have the parts. And the dealer lots were vacant for months. I mean, you couldn't buy a General Motors car for a long time. And they lost something like half a million car sales. Their overall sales were down by 37%. They lost like 33% of their market share. It was a big deal, even though those, that disruption started in a very localized way. There are some studies that were done by some folks at Georgia Tech that have shown that there's also a big financial impact even for relatively small disruptions. So for example, they showed that when a firm has a disruption, then they will see something like an average of a 40% reduction in their stock returns, 10% reduction in shareholder value, 7% reduction in sales growth, and then increases in their own costs, in their own inventory, and in their own equity risk. Okay, so there's a financial accounting kind of impact for disruptions as well. Third myth is that it's really expensive to protect against disruptions. Well, it's true that disruption prevention can be costly. I mean, if you said, all right, I want to build my supply chain so that even if there's an earthquake or a flood or a lightning strike, the factory will not be disrupted. 
I mean, that could be extremely expensive from a construction and engineering point of view. So preventing a disruption might be expensive, but protecting your supply chain in the event of a disruption is often not as expensive. As I've said before, supply chains already do some of this by mitigating demand uncertainty through inventory and dual sourcing and backup capacity and something called demand management and so on. But the point I wanna make here, and, and I'll show you this again later in the chapter in a little bit more detail, is that when we plot a trade-off curve for disruption, we get a shape that looks something like this usually. So let me explain how to read this curve. On the x-axis is the cost for, the, for a given solution in terms of if there is no disruption. Okay, so this is the cost of a given solution. Let's think about the UFLP, okay? If you didn't think about disruptions at all, and you just optimize the UFLP, you would get this solution up in the top left. That solution is really, is the cheapest possible solution for like the day-to-day, -day, the normal costs. But that solution might be very vulnerable to disruptions. And so if a disruption happens, you might have a very large cost, okay? On the other hand, you could build a super reliable solution that never gets disrupted, but it was super expensive to build. It's really big on the x-axis, but really small on the y-axis. We probably don't want that solution either. It turns out that in between, there are usually lots of other solutions that kind of strike a good balance between these two. So if this top one is the optimal solution, and I put optimal in quotes because um, it's only optimal if you're ignoring the risk, right? It's optimal if everything is deterministic. But if there's the risk of disruption, it's not really optimal anymore. But this next solution is still pretty cheap because it has a pretty small delta on the x-axis, but it has a really big delta on the y-axis, meaning it's a lot safer in terms of disruptions. And this kind of steep portion of the curve is very common. You see that in a lot of trade-off curves for problems like this, meaning it's often possible to buy a lot of protection for not too much money. And I always think of this like insurance premiums. I mean, you buy homeowner's insurance or auto insurance to protect you against catastrophic risk, right? You buy those that insurance, you pay a little bit every month so that if something really bad happens, you don't have to pay that big cost to be in the hospital for two weeks or to um, you know, repair your entire car, right? You pay a little bit extra in the upfront cost to save yourself a lot in the risk. And companies, just like individuals, are perfectly used to the idea of buying insurance. And so I would try to make the argument that they can buy this kind of insurance too, disruption insurance, through better supply chain management. You choose slightly different facilities or you choose slightly different inventory levels. And it might cost a little more on a day-to-day -day basis, but it will cost a lot less when a disruption happens. So this is my counter argument to the myth that disruptions are too expensive to protect against. And finally, the fourth myth that supply uncertainty and demand uncertainty are really the same thing. And so I'm already doing it and I don't need to worry about supply uncertainty. Um, as I said at the beginning, we, having too little supply is the same as having too much demand. We use similar mitigation strategies, so what's the big deal? Well, the good news is we've been studying and operating supply chains under demand uncertainty for decades. We know a lot about them, including the kinds of models we've talked about in this class and all of the best practices that industry has been using for a long time. Um, so that's good news. If supply and demand uncertainty are similar to each other and we know how to deal with demand uncertainty, that could be good. But the bad news is that the conventional wisdom, the things we know how to do are often wrong for supply uncertainty. And just to take one example, we'll talk later in the chapter about risk diversification effect. So you know that, in the, that the risk pooling effect says, if I have N separate warehouses and I'm thinking about consolidating them into one, the inventory cost will go down when I do that. It is better from an inventory perspective to consolidate those multiple warehouses into one warehouse. It might be worse for other reasons, it might be better for other reasons, but from an inventory perspective, 
consolidation is better. That's the risk pooling effect. The risk diversification effect says if you have N warehouses and you're thinking about consolidating them, it's a bad idea when there's a risk of supply disruptions because if that one giant warehouse gets disrupted, you're totally out of luck. Whereas if you have a bunch of warehouses and one of them gets disrupted, it only affects a portion of your supply chain. It, it's like the expression that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? And that effect is called the risk diversification effect. And it's completely the opposite of the risk pooling effect. So even though too much demand is the same as too much supply, and even though we know how to manage supply chains under demand uncertainty, that does not mean that the insights that we've learned from managing demand uncertainty translate to managing supply uncertainty, because in many cases, what you should do to protect against supply uncertainty is the exact opposite of what you should do to protect against demand uncertainty. So risk pooling versus risk diversification is really the same question as consolidating facilities versus having a whole lot of them. Um, another dichotomy here is lean supply chain management versus slack. Lean can be effective even if there's demand uncertainty. Slack is important if there's supply uncertainty. And we'll come back to talking about these questions later in the chapter. Okay, so. I hope I've disabused you of your four erroneous intuitions about supply chains and why we don't need to protect them against disruptions and um, convince you that these four myths are really only myths. And I think you're probably a, you're probably a, um, an easy audience. The much harder audience is the companies. And um, I've been trying to, to tell companies this through presentations I've given and things like that for many years with only marginal success and maybe now all, all of you can go out and, and, and spread, my, spread my message as well if you're so inclined. All right, any questions about that? All right, good. So we're gonna leave it here today. On Thursday, we will talk about more back to like the mathematical models, EOQ with supply disruptions, news vendor with yield uncertainty and so on. Um, but hopefully the stuff we talked about today will be good to just keep in your mind as we're talking about the more technical stuff. Okay. All right, guys.